So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala Rasulil Kareem. Basically, I'm sure all of you heard uh, Mr. Jordan Peterson's uh, taunt, you can say, uh, or talk to the Muslims or advice to the Muslims. We don't know what people's intentions are. They can be good, they can be bad. We only know the, as the Quran tells us in Sutul Kahf, which is the surah of the postmodern world. You know, Don't argue with them except what is apparent. So that's the rule. We don't know the hearts of the people. We look at what is apparent. And what we know, but when we look at the apparent, we have to look at the apparent. We have to be mindful of what is actually going on apparently because you know things do if you're even lying the lie detector will detect your lying this is the nature of things so when we look at uh, mr peterson's uh, conversation to the muslims and his taunt it's no different from you know it just so happened that this is what i was saying in my last talk for those of you who heard it uh, about the this the you know the the colonizer treats the colonized like they're noble savages like I'm going to teach you what you should do let me teach you what you should do and you know I've talked to enough of you and you know and uh, and I'm going to actually go over how he talks and what are his main points in his conversation from my perspective but there's uh, some things that I want to ask him. And so I want to start with my questions to Dr. Peterson because of his advice that he was trying to give to the Muslims. And then I'm going to go and actually explain to you what this man is really about and what are the lessons behind this. So number one, so are you, ask, are you willing to ask the Jews to become pen pals with the Nazis? Or if the U.S. took over Canada, you would ask the Canadian citizens to become pen pals of the U.S. invaders. Would you do that? I mean, he's a psychologist, right? He's supposed to know how to treat victims. He's supposed to know that, uh, that there needs to be an acknowledgement of the crime for people to mentally process it and move it on in their lives. Isn't he not supposed to know that? But no, according to him, he would ask Muslims to become pen pals with those who have hurt the Muslims rather than ask the Jewish people to uh, acknowledge the crimes that they have done. Question number two, why don't you tell the people, meaning the Muslims, you belong to and work for a right-wing ideology organization that is pro-Israeli. Why did he at this whole time, while he's giving his Bible lectures and all those things that he's doing, right? There's a dark side to being conservative. And that is that if you're conservative and you're uh, against uh, the exploitation of men versus women because islam believes in harmony not one opposing the other and uh even though what peter jordanson what he has said is good as an analysis of feminism but his solution is one of conflict again this is uh you know not the quranic harmony uh, uh view but what i'm trying to say is that when you see other people with common values it comes with the dark side the dark side is that they have the same values as you and you could get easily confused and this is exactly what Dijal is going to do he's going to see people have common needs he's going to see they need money they need resources they need food they need values they need religion they need this and he's going to exploit that so why don't you tell the muslims you belong to and work for a right-wing ideology that is pro-Israeli, okay? 
So you want to push the Abrahamic Accords. Now, this was really the second point he made. The first point, I'll, I'll go over it, but the second point he made and his punchline from which the rest of the whole conversation starts is the Abrahamic Accords and the, how, how happy he's about that and that Muslims need to get on with this idea of the Abrahamic Accords and then how you dare not, okay? So you want to push the Abrahamic Accords on Muslims without the consent of the Palestinians, meaning the Abrahamic Accords, they occurred uh, there was an idea one of uh, Trump's uh, people had. I'll show you who had this idea. Um, it was done, by the way, this Abrahamic Accords was done, what? To oppose I Iran. The, how can Israel and the Arab worlds get closer to oppose Iran, where this man is silly enough to tell Muslims, you should make Shias your pen pals. I don't have a mind. I don't mind Muslims, Sunni Muslims becoming pen pals with Shias. What I'm pointing out here is he doesn't, he's telling Muslims to become part of the Abrahamic Accords, whose very foundation is to oppose Iran. It's to get the Sunni world to oppose Iran. That's the very foundations of it. So you want to push the Abrahamic Accords on the Muslim world, right? Without the consent of the Palestinians, that he thinks it's fair to push a program upon a people who have not consented to that program. And then number four question, as a psychologist, you think the victim should be told to ignore the crimes against them? Is that what you as a professional clinical psychologist, you believe? This is your therapy method? You exemplified and revealed every hateful trope or stereotype against Muslims on purpose, or you could just not help it. Like you talked and you yelled and you scolded like a parent is talking to a child. Was that like you couldn't help it because of your white supremacist, uh, you know, uh, ultra right attitude that you got from your ideology or <coughs> what was behind it? or you wanted to make it so apparent that you're anti-Muslim so that your boss, okay, would be happy. You want to tell us to get along because, you know, Muslims don't get along. So Muslims should learn how to get along. Well, China, well, Russia is Christian. Why don't you get along with them? And number seven, do you think we are children by using the word Abrahamic and Abrahamic Accords, you, we will think you have a good will. Yes, you fooled many Muslims for a while. And every trickery comes to an end. So my main point here is that why did so many Muslims have such a good opinion about him? There's a lesson in this, a very, very important lesson. And that is that Remember that whoever gives you anything, true or not, falsehood will always be wrapped up in something true. Ali radiallahu anh, when he was dealing with the Khawarij, he said a very interesting statement at that time. He said when the Khawarij were de uh, declaring, in al hukmu illa lillah the hukam, the commandment should be according to whatever Allah wants, not what you want. And, you know, because when the uh, Muslims go into war, they have these spoils of war, right? And so there was the Khawarij were saying Ali goes into war, but doesn't take the spoils of war because he was fighting against Muslims at that time. So they didn't take spoils of war. And the Quran says to take spoils of war. This like this, they had other objections. So what did Ali say when he heard these objections? He said, haq, it's the true word, yuridu bihil batil, but he, they want something batil, falsehood from it. And why this is important is because remember that those were the days of fitna. And most of the ahadiths of fitna are either in the part of the, the predictions of what would happen immediately after the time of the prophet, or that most of the predictions of fitna and actually most of them, even from them, are about the end times. 
So either the Prophet was talking about the beginning, and very rarely has the Prophet hinted of anything in the middle. Most of it is all either about the end times itself or about what would happen immediately after his passing away, sallallahu alayhi wa So over there, and then in that, um, uh, the beginning, the fitan actually happened after, or it, it reached its peak, you can say, in the time of Ali, radiallahu anhu. And he says at that time, qawlul haqq, the word is true, yuridu bihil batil, but the intent that they have by saying this, true word is batil. And so you have to be careful uh, with these people because there's a lot of charlatans out there who um, say things, but their intent is not what they're saying. Their intent is something other than what they're saying. So now let's go on and see the rest of what I wanted to share with you. So, bismillah, alhamdulillah. Okay. Let some people in. So this is the man who came out with the idea of the Abrahamic Accords, just so everybody is clear. Okay. <coughs> His name is Jason Greenbald. He is the one who came out with the idea of the Abrahamic Accords. And what is the idea of the Abrahamic Accords? Over here, I just want to maybe give for those people who don't know so that they have an understanding. And every Muslim scholar should have a basic understanding, just like I don't have a deep understanding. I have a basic understanding. Prior to the Abrahamic Accords, Israel had a, you can say, a peace agreement with Egypt and I think Jordan, okay, two countries. But they were not agreements of normalization. Just that we have peace and that's it. But the Abrahamic Accord is an agreement to normalize everything. Meaning what? We will have trade. We will have investments. We will have, in, 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 we will have institutions of ours. We can have our, uh, our synagogues. We can have all these things. The complete normalization. Just like Americans go to Canada or Canadians come to America or like this type of relationship that anyone of these people can go anywhere. Uh, Muslims can go and pray in Al-Aqsa and the Jews can go and, uh, and, and do investments and buy property in uh, UAE or so on and so forth. This is normalization. This is one aspect. The other aspect was, is that we have a common enemy. Saudi Arabia had been feeling the pressure of, you can say, uh, Iran, because Iran has surrounded uh, Saudi Arabia. On the one side, you have Bahrain, which is majority, a big number, a big percentage is Shia. Then you have Shias in uh, Lebanon. You have Shias in Syria. You have Shias in Yemen, right? So it's all surrounded by Shia. And then 15% of Saudi uh, uh, population is Shia, where the oil refineries are in that area is all Shia. So Iran uh, was able to put pressure on Saudi. And Iran had been using, you know, its stance against Israel as one of its, you can say, politi political currencies. Anyhow, Saudi Arabia was feeling this pressure. So now, and the Arab world was feeling this pressure. So now the Arab world and Israel had something in common, which was that they had a need to curb. And as much as Iran doesn't want that, uh, as much as Israel doesn't want that Iran should have a nuclear power. The Arab world also felt that, how can it be that uh, if we don't have a nuclear bomb, we, the Arab world, then how can Iran have one? So now, you know, Iran is also aligned with Russia. And then the Sun Sunni states, they're all aligned with uh, Washington, D.C. So this became, you can say, normalization. 
it also includes a military component. And by the way, when the war with Iran will happen, which it will happen because the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he is truthful and he said it and it will happen. It's just a matter of time. This is what they're building towards. And the Prophet said the first people to be destroyed will be the people of Faris, meaning Persia. So the war is going to happen. But it will also be the, uh, you can say, the end of many chapters in, in history. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. Only that they're getting prepared and the war will happen. And uh, it will be a war of great consequences when it finally happens. Anyway, so in this scenario where Saudi was feeling and the Arab world was feeling pressure, so now Israel and Saudi and Israel and the Arab world have combined also military power to curb uh, the influence of Iran. Okay, so this is the Abrahamic Accords. Now, the word that they kept, Abraham, why did they choose, uh, you know, in, in a secular society, in a secular world, why did they choose this word, word Abraham? There is, you can say, the outward uh, the zahir of it, which is that he's the common between the Muslims and Christians and Jews. So it's a good uh, idea from that perspective. But there's another aspect that becomes revealed and becomes open, becomes zahir when you get, go a little deeper, which I will in a little bit. Okay. So now this is the scenario, the Abrahamic Accords that now this person that I showed you who came up with the idea of the Abrahamic Accords, he didn't consult Palestinians. No, he was on the Trump administration and Trump pushed it down the throat, just like he pushed down the throat of the Palestinians and the Muslim world for that matter, that Jerusalem is now I've declared it. Jerusalem is now the, uh, the capital and the American embassy will be uh, relocated in, uh, in Jerusalem and is currently being built uh, in an area that is part of actually the settlers, supposed to be the settlers' uh, land. Anyway, that's a separate issue. And uh, uh, so the, uh, he declared that he gave the Golan Heights to the uh, Jewish people, and he was about to, Trump, that is, about to declare, uh, I don't want to go into too much of the political details, but anyway, in that whole scenario that where Trump was, this man came up with this idea of Abrahamic Accords. Okay, so this is giving you a little bit of the background. Okay, and as you can see, what is this person wearing? He's wearing a yarmulke, right? So they didn't consult any of the Palestinians. Palestinians were not a party to any of these conversations. It was put down their throat looking at the benefit that the Arab world, the rest of their, their brothers could benefit from. So they proposed it to them and they said yes. And then that became a, uh, so now the Muslims had at the political level had completely abandoned the Palestinians because they, want, they knew Israel is the startup com uh, country, has the most startup businesses. All the big businesses are going to be in Israel in the future. And they saw this and they, uh, the, you know, and, and then Saudi Arabia wants to do its new Yom project and other projects. So they said, okay, let's, let's make uh, normalized relationships. It'll also be good for our security. Another thing that some people said is that, you know, uh, American troops were leaving the Arab world and Afghanistan. So they felt that, okay, the other way to be close to America is to get too close to Israel. So all these things were happening. Okay. So this is now kind of like the background from where I want to start. So this is the Daily Wire. The Daily Wire is where Jordan Peterson works. Okay. And Jordan uh, Peterson, uh, this group of people, Daily Wire, is not just uh, any channel. Okay. It's a channel with a ideology. It's a channel with a certain agenda, with a certain program, with a certain political view of the world. And it is owned by, number one, Ben Shapiro, as I will show you in a second. His 
nasty language about Muslims. By the way, he tweeted once that Israel loves to build buildings and the Arabs love to bomb buildings. So this is who he, this person's working for. This is Zahir. This is not conspiracy theory. This is not, uh, you know, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll even make it more clear, inshallah, as, as uh, the time goes by. So who owns Daily Wire? Um, Daily Wire is owned by, number one, Ben Shapiro. And by the way, Ben Shapiro, just a few days ago, uh, you know, he was heading the international conference in Israel. If you look at Jordan Peterson and don't understand he is a pro-Zionist Christian, okay, even looking at his Bible talks and the type of commentaries he uses, in his Bible, which means he believes in the end, because these Christians, the Ben Shapiro type Christians, they are pro-Zionists and they're pro-end times from the perspective of Ezekiel and from the perspective of how they read the Bible. Okay, Ben Shapiro, you've, you've spun your uh, whatever. Um, so, okay. Uh, Daily Wire, which now boasts uh, 800,000, almost a million subscribers, signs on Jordan Peterson. Ben Shapiro heading international conference in Israel. Okay, this is the guy who has been speaking at almost every chance he gets against Muslims, even against care. Okay, so forget about people like me and you, care. You know, he, he tried to debate on the word uh, jihad that was once used by one of the care members and <coughs> so on and so forth. So now um, the other person who owns uh, uh, this Daily Wire, his name is Be uh, Jeremy Boring. Okay. This guy, he's a pastor, just like Jordan gives his lectures in the churches. Well, he's one of those people. And uh, now I'm just uh, showing you an image from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, the Abrahamic Accords and the changing shape of the Middle East. Okay. And so he's pushing Abrahamic Accords on us. And his whole conversation, when I explain this to you, if you listen now again, his conversation, it'll become clear that the central point of his conversation was the Abrahamic Accords. Okay, but let me just move on so I can quickly say what I want to say. Um, yeah, so this is just some more of the Abrahamic Accords declaration. So this was the declaration that they did. And here are the countries that signed in Israel and Bahrain. Israel in Morocco, Israel in UAE, and Sudan. So these are the countries that have signed on to normalization, which includes, meaning from the side of Sudan, from the side of Morocco, that part of that agreement, if you read it, is to curb the, um, the influence of Iran. So the question becomes you know, interesting also, uh, that it wasn't by chance that he also, amongst other people, interviewed Hamza Yusuf. Because why? Hamza Yusuf is part of that country that gave the fatwa that Abrahamic Accords are a positive thing. If you remember those days, I had done a video on this also. Hamza Yusuf faces scandal over Israel-UAE deal blames fake news. And he said, no, 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 but then he never, but he gave a fatwa and his sheikh uh, bin Bayya gave the fatwa, okay? And this, uh, by the way, um, magazine Middle East Eye is actually very good and very reputable. And I've always found information from them as very strong. Uh, influential Muslim scholar Hamza Yusuf criticized for backing UAE Israel deal. And that was the Abrahamic Accords, okay? So Hamza Yusuf, it's not by chance that he was called on for this final interview uh, 
to kind of see, okay, where is Hamza Yusuf also? And if you may remember that part when he was talking to Hamza Yusuf, he's like, well, I want to, you know, what if I want to be, uh, what if I want to be Muslim, Christian, and Jew all at the same time? Hamza Yusuf did say, Alhamdulillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. He did say, well, if you want to be Muslim, Christian, and Jew, then just become Muslim. Right? But that aside, but I'm, I'm pointing to the reason why Hamza Yusuf may have been uh, one of the people that he called on to his program, okay, uh, was because he had endorsed the fatwa for the Abrahamic Accords. UAE attempt to get Muslim scholars to endorse Israel deal fail, uh, falls flat, okay. Uh, historic UAE Israel trade deal proves Abrahamic Accords resilience. So this is the United States Institute of Peace. And, you know, they're talking about how great this has been. Of course, for, from uh, an Israeli perspective, this has been great because they have convinced basically the Arab world and the Muslim world for that matter, that they need to ignore the Palestinian issue. They need to ignore the refugee issue. And they need to just focus on their trade and, their, and the agenda that uh, Israel wants them to pay attention to. Uh, they've isolated the Palestinians. And so as the fitnas increase, no one is going to really care about what's happening to the Palestinians. Uh, over here, let's just continue, inshallah. Uh, Israel's rewarding road to normalization. Okay, so this is about how Israel has been rewarding the Arab nations. Uh, Iran is beginning to understand the Abrahamic Accords, meaning it's beginning to understand the influence and the, and the result of the Abrahamic Accords. Um, Israel apartheid against Palestinians, a cruel system of domination and a crime against humanity. The point of bringing this up for me was to show uh, Dr. Jordan that uh, he, he's talking about the Abrahamic Accords, but these Abrahamic Accords are not by the consent of the Muslims, no. They're not by the consent of the Palestinians, no. They're not the consent of, uh, 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 they're the consent of a few leaders in the world who are not even, for the most part, legitimate leaders of the Muslims. So why is he shoving down that political uh, view down our throat? And then many Muslims who have been listening to him for you know, some time are going to listen to him and say, well, maybe his good intentions, maybe this is not that bad. They're going to hear the word Abraham and they're going to fall for the trap, not knowing what is really going on. And so let's continue, inshallah. And uh, over here, I'm just pointing out the number of refugees only, just only one aspect of this. As of 2019, more than 5.6 million Palestinians were registered with the UN refugee uh, uh, group uh, as refugees, okay? So in Jordan, there are about 2 million. The West Bank, almost 700,000 uh, camps. Syria has 500,000. Lebanon has 400,000. And uh, let's just continue, inshallah. You know, Palestinians are the largest refugee camp in the world. And uh, so Jordan is, of course, not going to bring up the issues of justice. And this is the sign of the one who is on the truth versus the one who is not on the truth. So the first one I said is that they dangle the truth and wrapped around falsehood. Or the other way to understand the same phenomenon is what Ali radiallahu anh said, قَوْلُ الْحَقْ يُرِيدُ بِهِ الْبَاطِلِ the true word, but they want something falsehood from it. Okay. N number two is what they will talk about peace and they will not talk about justice. This is the number two sign that what? That they are up to no good. Because the words of Quran are true and the Quran says, and when it is said to them, right? Or, or uh, they say, uh, when it is said to them, don't cause facade in the world. This is how the Quran begins. 
And this is how Quran, by the way, the first portion of the Quran, and I'll make this clear. So uh, if by the very long chance that Mr. Peterson actually watched my video, which would, um, of course, never happen, but, uh, but for Muslims, this will be interesting also. Okay, so the Baqarah starts with the first five ayat introduce the believers, the true believers. Okay, the first five ayat. Then after that, I think there are almost 18 verses describing the hypocrite. Oh, sorry. After that, there are two verses describing the disbeliever. Who is the disbeliever? The one who has decided to oppose Islam and the Muslims at any cost. Those who now, they're on that bandwagon. They're going to oppose Islam no matter what. And then this portion of the Quran generally has been considered as talking to the munafiqi. But the other opinion, which is less known, that this portion of the Quran, ayahs 8, 9, 10, 11, all the way till I think ayah 19, is actually talking to the Jews. This is the other opinion. So in other words, Allah is saying the same thing to the Jews that he's saying to the hypocrites. Now, part of that is what? They will come to you and they, they will say, we believe. And this is the part that becomes very Dajjalic, okay? Now, ayah number eight, that's the first ayah that Allah is discussing the hypocrites. Or ayah eight, the first ayah Allah is discussing with the Jewish people. So, ba'da'a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, wa min nas and amongst people are man yaqulu who say, amanna billahi wa bil yawm al-akhir. They say we believe in Allah in the Day of Judgment. Because the Jews... And the Christians, they'll say they believe. They just won't believe in Risala. They won't believe in the prophethood. But they'll say they believe in Allah and His Messenger. But they're not believers because it's not enough to believe in Allah and the Day of Judgment. They want to deceive Allah. And those who believe. And they don't deceive. Except themselves, they're only deceiving themselves. And they don't even perceive it. In their hearts is a disease. And Allah will increase that disease. And for them is a severe punishment because of the lie that they utter. Now, what's the first sign of these people? And when it is said to them, Don't cause corruption in the world. They say, No, no, no. We're making peace. We're making peace. Salaha yaslahu. Over here, the translation the brother made was reformers, which is also okay. But salaha yaslahu means to make peace. We're, we're, fi we're trying to fix things. We're trying to make peace. The Quran will give you that insight. That those people that say we are peacemakers, we're just doing peace. We want peace. What does Allah say? Allah, beware. No, they're causing corruption. But they don't perceive it. They actually think they're doing something good. But they're actually not doing anything good. They're doing nothing but bringing facade. Why are they? They've convinced themselves. Every person has to convince themselves that... Uh, well, look, the greater good, the good will be greater on the greater side. There will be good. There won't be facade. But what is it? Those who talk about peace and don't talk about justice, this is the second sign that this is the jalik. Okay? And it's not by chance that this is in the very beginning of Quran. As soon as you read Fatiha, this is the message that's given. Okay? Let's continue, inshallah. Oh, let me... Um... Go back here. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So this is the point I was trying to make. Abrahamic Accords isolate Palestinians, solidify Israel's apartheid rule. So that has been the benefit to Israel also.
progressive groups tell Congress to reject dangerous Abrahamic accords. So some Christians, they're still against it, right? So just making this point, it'll become more clear as I continue. UAE-Israel deal, Abrahamic Accord, or Israeli colonialism. Everybody, again, this is the same uh, uh, online magazine, Middle East Eye. They have very good articles. UAE-Israel deal, Abrahamic Accord, or Israeli colonialism. Now there's some parts I want to share with you that you will find. Uh... Sure. So this is Ben Shapiro, okay? What is he talking about here? Uh, SubhanAllah. Here's the truth about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Okay, so he's very much into this. I want you to understand this. He's very much into this. White House, listen. <laughs> supporters maintain the word causing fierce backlash has been taken out of con. Help the disenfranchised to stand. So here's Ben Shapiro arguing with uh, Brother Hassan uh, with about the whole word she used, jihad against uh, Trump. And, and, you know, Ben Shapiro is clearly on this right wing Fox News. He's been invited to Fox News over and over again. Something that Hamza Yusuf and all the Muslims that were thinking, oh, he'll become Muslim. Oh, he's so nice to Muslims. Oh, you know, he has so many values like us. But you all didn't see how many times this person, Ben Shapiro, has been invited at Fox News. It just, uh, it's interesting. You know, if you type in Ben Shapiro and Fox, right? This should give you an idea. You don't even, you didn't even... You should know who he's working for, who's paying his bills. You should know where he's being promoted, who's promoting him. That should be like obvious. Then there are spiritual rules that I talked about the two. It should have been obvious from there that, look, he's mostly on Fox News. Didn't anyone think, does someone think that somebody who's invited to Fox News will become Muslim? You know, Hamza Yusuf did great, mashallah, talking to him. But he used all his opportunities to be pro-Israel, bash the Muslims, and bash the left. And that's what he did. Now, this is the other portion that I wanted to talk about. See if I can do this. Also, we know the Bible says that when they say in the book of Thessalonians says, when you see, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh. So we got to, this is this is what I'm trying to say. The covenant will many will ultimately break down. Okay. And it will all. The covenant of many is about an end times Christian prophecy in the Bible that before the antichrist comes there will be peace okay and then the antichrist will come and he'll fight and all these things will happen and then everything will collapse so many right-wing christians fox news christians believe what they believe that this peace accord will not last they believe that they believe that as part of their faith all because of the temple mount even after they're getting along fine for three and a half years, even after the temple gets built and th millions of people are coming to see it and everything looks like it's going to work out. The Antichrist, the anti-Semitic, the hatred of Israel. and The anti-Semitic, meaning the Muslims, okay, over here. And so in his view, it's the Muslims that are going to what? And what I'm trying to say is that this is a typical stereotype, but now see how it's being turned around how by telling us we should accept the peace accords 
even though according to their Bible, it will never work out. According to their Bible, there's going to be an Armageddon. You don't think that uh, uh, Peter, uh, Jor uh, Mr. Jordan doesn't know about Ezekiel? He doesn't know about what their Bible says about the end time prophecies? That he's so, you know, uh, this is, a, I, I don't want to play the clip, uh, but Israel's apartheid against Palestinians, you know, they have the largest prison system in the world, but they what? Make it look like, oh, it's all good. Now, I want to show you parts of this. The way it could be called in Israel. Israel doesn't want to compromise on security. They have to do a blockade. They have to kind of cut this up. It's, you know, it's ridiculous what people have to go through there, but it's also ridiculous what we have to do to keep ourselves safe. We don't want to fight with them. But if they ask for it, they will get it. And we're much stronger, much stronger. We are, we are very, behave very gently and, and more morally. So I'm just going to show you some parts in this video and the other videos that shows the true, you could say, the, uh, the hatred. You know, he was talking about writing pen pals to, to the Jews. Well, he should be saying the uh, same thing to the Jews. Very gently with them. Mm. It could get a lot worse, is what yeah. you're saying. If, if, if the Russians was here, two days, they will kill all of them. If the Americans will be here, they will kill them two days. They don't care. This is called projecting, projecting your thoughts and your wishes on other people. And then saying, well, if they were here, meaning if, if it was up to me, I can see this happening. About human rights, they don't care about nothing. Israel's holding back. Very, very. But it's war and civilians get killed in war and it's a horrible, you know, on their side, less on our side. But at the same time, it's, we put money into protecting ourselves. Look, the refugees, are, is, it's, their situation is horrible, but no other nation in the world gets the refugee status that Palestinians do. The Palestinians, third generation people are still considered refugees. You know, I had friends that were Canadian. They went on their passports. They want to see what the refugee camps were. They want to see what it was all about. They came back. They said, it's nothing what I imagined it. Like yeah. better than they imagined? Or? They said people were driving around with nice cars, people had nice houses, villas, things like that. They thought people were being oppressed, like, you know, like living in tents. It's like they probably were, like maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, like in the past. For them, in order. So let me see if I can show you another part. Uh, first of all, it's very hard. I also am an organization. It's called Lava. It's against the Jews should have marry Arabs. Did you say the organization was did what again? We the organization the organization is the the thing of it is to that Jews should marry Arabs shouldn't marry Arabs. Yeah. Why do you feel strongly about that? Because. Jews is a special nation that God gave it to the Jews, and we don't want Jews to get mixed up with, together with a different nation. I think Israelis have to take over, and uh, they have to kick them, uh, kick them away. It will be much better not to, not to kill them, just to to go back to. Arab now remember, this is the words people are using. What in front of the media, and they know they're in front of the media, right? Well, mafi qulubihim akbar, and what is in their hearts is even worse. You can't deal with these people. There's no need to try. There's no need to talk to them. What we can do is when they, they, they do enough harm, we retaliate. That's war, and that's the situation that any Jew lives in Israel has to deal with. Okay, so I think I made my point. Let's see what else we got here. Okay. I think I can skip this. And this is the part of the part of the Bible also that talks about the peace. There's peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So this is there in their Bible, okay? 
they understand this, that these Abrahamic Accords are not the long-term solution. They want to use the Muslims to fight against Iran, to fight against the king of the north, as they call it, okay? And uh, in the north, these countries like Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Russia, they consider all of these their enemies, okay? Um, the defeat of Gog, uh, they consider us to be Gog Magog, according to them, even though it's talking about them in the Bible. And, you know, this is talking, according to them, it's talking about the uh, Jewish, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the Turkish people, the, um, the Rosh, the Russians, and all these countries that are in the north, uh, Ethiopia, Persia, Libya, right? Uh, the uh, Gog had also allies, meaning the enemies of Israel, will have uh, their uh, allies to the west of Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, so on and so forth. Okay. All right. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. I think we're at the very end of this. Hi, all. I have been informed. Now uh, we can watch what he said. Maybe at a faster pace, a little bit, but from the perspective of now me explaining to you his, and I still have to explain to you the, his last words. Now pay attention as you're paying attention to this, to his last words, because those are also very meaningful. His first, first he talks about, you know, thank you for subscribing, you're Muslims, I understand Muslims listen to me. Oh, that's great. Then he talks about the Abrahamic Accords, and then he shoots off to be talking about being pen pals and how Muslims need to go across the divide or across sectarian groups. And then finally, he ends that we're all going to go to Jannah. Okay, so you'll see this. Formed by many sources and also observed online, not least because of my discussions with a variety of Muslim thinkers, supporters, and critics, that I have developed an audience in the Muslim world. <laughs> I would first like to say that I could not be more pleased or honored that such is the case. It has been so heartening to see that my biblical lectures, for example, attracted a large Muslim audience, and that the comments from the Muslim watchers and listeners to my YouTube channel and podcast have been so extraordinarily positive. And all this is lovely to see in the aftermath of the extraordinary Abraham Accords, which have laid out the possibility for peace between all the people of the book in an unprecedented manner. And I have something to say as an extension of all of this. Please forgive my presumption, if you would. It is time for those of you in the Muslim world to stop fighting among yourselves, you Shiites and Sunnis. You, you, you Shiites and Sunnis. So you see the attitude? And also time to stop regarding the Christians, and even more specifically, the Jews, as your enemies. See that sarcasm? And more specifically, the Jews as your enemies. Like, you're a Christian. Why do you care about the Jews all of a sudden? Why? Not least because you have the enemy located in the wrong place. First, the best place to find Satan, let's say, is within. If you Okay, so this argument was so bogus, right? It's like the most bogus argument I've ever heard. Okay, so Satan is within. So he doesn't do anything in the external world. He doesn't do anything with the external world. Is that what you're saying? He, I mean, the, the, so you, you, you find the Satan within, within who? Within only the Muslims or that, that same Satan also is inside Christians and Jews. And so if you identify this Satan that's within me, the shaitan that's within me, if I identify him and I identify his works in the outside world, they are both connected together. And he didn't seem to make that connection at all. The true enemy is in someone else's heart. Then you haven't thought nearly long enough about the darkness within. And you have therefore fallen prey to the most subtle temptation of the ancient demonic spirit. So your best bet on the spiritual warfare front is to make of yourself and your Muslim practice something so admirable that the light shining from your well-constituted psyches and productive, generous, and wise actions is so intense that people convert to your faith from sheer admiration. Do you think after all of the propaganda against Islam, people convert because of the force of a gun or 
out of sheer admiration today. Every day people convert out of the sheer admiration for the Quran or the sheer admiration of another Muslim or the sheer admiration of the Prophet What is he talking about? He has no, no insight in, into the reality of what's happening in the world. There is a goal. Second, far more unites you with the other people of the book as your own prophet himself, peace be unto him, forthrightly said, than what divides you. You all believe, for example, in a book. You all believe, for example, in God and believe that you have an ultimate duty to that God. You are all followers of a prophetic tradition. And that is a tradition that unites the wisdom of the past with the vision and voice of those willing to see and speak truly and lovingly in the present. And you are all threatened in a very real sense by the system of vengeful Luciferian ideas that currently confronts all that is transcendent. Right. He never, uh, Ben Shapiro coming on Fox News, never expressed any hate towards Muslims. I mean, they never expressed hate towards feminism or the ideas that they're against, right? They've been so loving and kind to them. They've become pen pals to the people that they, why don't they become pen pals to the feminists that they've been speaking against? And then traditional and valuable on the sexual front, on the familial front, on the conceptual front, on the psychological and sociological front, and in the final analysis, on the theological front, so how about we all quit squabbling over trinkets and details and face the real problem? So here, let's forget about the past. That's what he's saying. Forget about, let's forget about what happened. Let's now move forward with the Abrahamic Accords. And I should also point out that it is not the individual carriers of the woke, politically correct, degenerate, neo-Marxist ideas that should be regarded as the enemy either. First, Meaning everything I've been speaking against, that's not the real enemy. The real enemy is Satan, of course. You must take the idea that the satanic impulse within is the prime enemy with all due seriousness. Second, we must... And he talks as if the real enemy of Satan only exists within Muslims and not within Christians and not within Jews. Understand that even those quite possessed by the spirit of Cain that attracts and drives confused and lost people to the Luciferian ideologies of the materialist utopians are, in the ideal, fully redeemable and only partially consumed. Even the committed student ideologues who have, for example, attacked me and others like me rather viciously are generally, say, 90% or perhaps 80, reasonable and potentially civilized people who could still see the light. Muslims. Reach across the sectarian divide, Shiites. Find a Sunni pen pal. Communicate with someone on the other side. Sunnis, do the same. And then maybe reach out tentatively to a Christian. or Sarcastic remark. Or even, heaven forbid, a Jew. Because perhaps it is time for those who purport to be followers of God to act like it. And to be convincing in those actions, even to those whose premature cynicism and skepticism have driven them into the towers of Babel constructed by the avatars of the resentful intellect. Is there someone in the Muslim world willing to build an electronic system to bring people from the Sunni and Shia? And so now he is saying, together? if you do build such a system where Sunnis and Shias or, you know, Muslims and Christians and Jews can talk to each other, build it, and then I will support you. A place where people of goodwill could reach electronically across the divide, person to person, and to formulate the kinds of personal, trusting friendships upon which a lasting peace truly might be founded? A place where Jews and Christians, willing and eager to open communication with their Muslim brothers, might do just that? There's a task for someone looking for a purpose, and it's an open invitation to do just that. If you build it, they will come. If you build it, get in touch with me. You'll figure out how to do it, and I'll publicize it. Thank you, all my Muslim listeners, watchers, and readers, for your kind attention and patience. I wish you well as you strive <coughs> to become the light in the world that your faith truly demands. Let's see if we can unite as people of the book and negotiate our way toward the paradise that we might truly and jointly attain. Now, here's the part. 
paradise that we may truly and jointly attain. This is exactly what both uh, in the hadith of, of, uh, of the hadith of uh, the hadith in which the Sahabi, I forget his name right now, Tamim Adarmi, when he goes to the island. And what is said, he's your prophet, he's the prophet of the Arabs. And when that Sahabi who was getting the inspiration from the Jal, who many of the companions considered him to be the Jal himself, <clears throat> when he was asked, or when the Prophet asked him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, uh, what do you say of me? He said, I say you're a prophet, but you're a prophet of the Arabs. So this is now how it's going to be. This is part of that, you know, like we'll go to Jannah. We'll all go to Jannah jointly. Can either A mean A, that if we start talking, then you might become Christian or Jew and you might go to Jannah. Which Quran alludes to that also. Be Jew or Christian, you'll be guided. You won't get into Jannah except if you're Christian or Jew. He could be alluding to that. Or he can be alluding to what uh, Dajjal was saying to uh, uh, Tamim Adarmi, which was that, yeah, you have, he's an Arab prophet, but that's, you know, he, the Arabs can believe in him. And many Jews hold this type of view is that, oh, the prophet is an Arab prophet and he's a prophet for the Arabs which is a oxymoron because if you say somebody's a prophet and that prophet says I'm a prophet to all of the world and I'm the last prophet then it, you can't say both right but anyway then uh, I forget the name of the person who was in the time of the prophet who was considered the Jal right now in my mind it's escaping me but he's very his name is well known uh <clears throat> Uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad so anyway so what, when the prophet said who do you think I am he gave the same answer that the Jal gave to Tamim ad you're a prophet of the Arabs so this kind of like uh, Abra and you know this uh, khutbah that was given by the Zionist sheikh this, uh, in Arafah this year uh, he, he's part of that same group that where the feeling within, you become so close to them in friendship, that the feeling within is, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, we're all similar, very similar, same, and we're all going to go to Jannah. This, and what will happen in the end times is that the majority of the religions, their real faces will have changed, as has already changed for Christianity, and has already changed for Judaism. But also for Islam, the majority of the people of the Muslims, their picture of Islam will be different from its real picture. Only a minority will be left that will know the true Islam, will be intact with the true Islam. This is why the Prophet said, Tuba lil ghuraba, congratulations for the people that will be like strangers. Because when they're going to look at their own, they're going to be like, this is, not, <laughs> this is not the Islam that I know. This is a different Islam. This is a completely watered down. Uh, twisted, uh, politically twisted, unnatural version of, of the deen. Anyway, <coughs> what I want to end with is that those of us Muslims who were very impressed with Dr. Jordan, they need to, and, and what an embarrassment at the level of for us to be thinking this man who whose boss is invited to Fox News all the time for us to actually have such high hopes. Oh, I think he and, you know, when the message came to the message to the Muslim community, many, many Muslims thought at that time, what that Oh, he must have declared his Islam because Hamza Yusuf talked to him. So he must have become Muslim. This is the level of thinking of many of the Muslims. And then the other embarrassing thing was, is that he taunted the Muslims, was sarcastic to the Muslims, just like a white man who gets to tell the colonized what they should be doing and thinking and who's good amongst them and who's bad amongst them. If you're with the Abrahamic Accords, you're a good Muslim. And if you're bad, if you're not with the Abrahamic Accords, you're a bad Muslim, right? He uh, taking that same colonizer approach and that colonizer white supremacist attitude 
Fox News attitude, you can say, right? Is telling me, the Muslim, well, how, if I'm good or bad. And no Muslim stood up and everyone gave a lukewarm response to him. And didn't, man, most people didn't even understand what he was trying to really say. What was he really saying? He's trying to de define for the Muslims who is a good Muslim and who is a bad Muslim. How you should behave and how you shouldn't behave. And what you should accept and what you shouldn't accept. Basically what your creed, your aqidah should be. Walaul bara out the door. So anyway, the point being that uh, majority of the Muslims gave a very lukewarm response. The brother who runs the channel smiled to Jannah, alhamdulillah. He caught on to the Abrahamic Accord point. And he pointed to an article written by one of the brothers, I think, that also pointed in the right direction. Otherwise, besides him, I didn't, at least to my attention, no other. And there's Dr. Khalid Abu Fadl, uh, may Allah, he also uh, recognized, I think, uh, the reality of uh, what was being said. Other than that, majority of the scholars, they have no idea what was being said, what he said, and what slap he put on the face of the Muslim community in the West, particularly. And I say that Muslims should give a harsh response to him. You should, uh, in the comment section, be very like firm and very strong and say that, okay, you know, if he believes in, in this, then, you know, become, and then I'll end by this, inshallah ta'ala, and I won't take any more. Uh, oh, yes, I'm sure, absolutely sure that the brother you just mentioned right now, it's very hard for me to say his name, Daniel. Brother Daniel, I can't say his last name. Uh, okay, I'm sure he said something too, maybe, yes. I don't know what he said, so I don't want to comment on it. But usually, Brother Daniel gets it uh, right. Now, uh, let me go back to... Let me, as... Because it's not in my tabia, it's not in my nature, I wish... You know, one of the YouTube video or people who are very good at uh, expressing themselves uh, sarcastically and dramatically would ask these questions to Mr. Jordan. Are you willing to ask the Jews to become pan pals with the Nazis? Or if the U.S. took over Canada, would you ask Canadian citizens to become pen pals of their U.S. invaders? Tell me, Mr. Jordan. Why don't you tell the Muslims you belong to, uh, you work for a boss who is very close to Fox News, who's right wing and who is pro-Israeli. So you want to push the Abrahamic Accords on the Muslims without their consent, without the consent of the Palestinians, and you think that, you know, your call for peace is somehow going to just fool us? As a psychologist, you think the victims should be told to ignore the crimes against them? You don't think the question of justice should play a role in this, any of this? This is your method of therapy, you know, because the method of therapy that I learned is that when there's a victim, the first thing the victim wants to hear is that, yes, something wrong has been done to you. You know, we're sorry for the troubles you went through. And our court system in Islam tells us that you, that the, the, that the, the perpetrator of the crime should be punished so the victim feels some, uh, some release of tension and stress. You exemplified and revealed every hateful trope in your sarcasm, in your way of talking against Muslims. And I wonder if it was on purpose or you just couldn't help yourself from the way, by the way you talked. You want to tell us to get along. Well, if you want to keep, simplify things that much, then Russia is... Christian and very good Christians. Why don't you get along with them before you talk to us? Do you think we are children by using the word Abrahamic? You're going to use the name of our prophet to try to fool us? Like, that's shameful. By using the word Abrahamic, we will think you have a good will? No. I know 100%, alhamdulillah, that Mr. Jordan has no good will towards Muslims at all. I'm very clear about that because of. The things that he said, the Quran tells me people who talk like him, they're up to no good. So 
inshallah this is what i wanted to share with all of you and i will be uploading this today inshallah i hope you found this beneficial too shall i'm going to stop the recording and uh and then if there's any questions maybe we can take a few questions and then we can end inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah